for the Lord Jesus a wonderful round of applause. We're about to start this meeting, and I'm absolutely certain that it's going to be a great blessing from God in your life. Since we began speaking on this lesson, and this is the fifth meeting, I've been talking about this, this verse. It's one of my favorites from Matthew chapter 9, verse number 2. It's about the healing of the paralytic man when Jesus saw the faith of those men, he healed that paralytic man. Whenever Jesus sees our faith in action, he prepares a declaration for us. That man needed his sins to be forgiven. They needed to be forgiven so that he could be healed. And there are many people in this situation, and they are consciously and constantly sinning, and they have not repented, and as of then they have been stumbling and stumbling. Unless they come to their senses soon, and repent in front of God unless they seek the Lord Jesus, and this is something you do through faith, the people saw Jesus preaching the word in Capernaum, and they were convinced. And four of them brought that man on a bed, for he was lying on a bed, and they brought him there before Jesus, going through the roof. And when Jesus saw their faith of those four men, and the faith of everyone who was there, and the faith of that man, Jesus said to him, Your sins are forgiven you. And he called him Son. From then on, he could be healed and delivered already. And why? Because the Lord God was working in his life. This discussion we're having is just great. I'm going to repeat some things again briefly because this is essential for you. Before our meeting started, I was talking about Psalm 18, verse number 47, and those who are at home should read that a little later. And I'll get back to Genesis at, at chapter 32, but a little bit later. But now let's go to Psalms. I like this one here in Psalm 18, verse 47. The Lord God used David to give the following message. It is God who avenges me. This is very serious. When people are being attacked by an evil spirit or by a serious illness, which could be a mild fever or maybe a mild pain to something really serious, and they must learn that this word is absolutely true. God will absolutely avenge them. Now God shall not avenge them against any human being who has been used by the devil to attack them. God shall avenge them against the powers of darkness. And avenge here is as described in Job. The devil took everything that Job had and God gave Job twice as much. And today we also have to believe. I lost my help. I wasted my time. I was affected. But God is reminding me to believe right now because unless you believe, God will do nothing. It's just useless if you're aware of your rights, if you're educated in the truth of the word, but you don't put your faith to use. You shall be immediately excluded. If you think you're different from others, and you think you don't need to obey, you don't need to be saintly, you don't need to pray seriously, you don't need to seek God or read the Bible, to be filled by the Holy Spirit, but you need those things just as anyone does. And the moment that God sees your faith, when he finally sees your faith in action, God will make a declaration. If it's about forgiving sins, God shall say your sins are forgiven. If it's about healing, God shall say you're healed. If it's both, God shall do the same thing. Jesus' declaration was complete. Son, your sins are forgiving you. And all those people had questions in their hearts. But who is this man to forgive us? Jesus knows everything. Just so you know that I have the power to forgive sins, I say, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. And the man arose completely healed and went to his house. God was completely avenging that man. The devil was defeated in that situation. And the end of the verse, which is just as important as the beginning, reads as follows. Brethren, pay close attention and subdues the peoples, those groups of demons under me, all of them. In Luke 10, 17, Luke 10, 19, it's Luke. Shall we open our Bibles to the book of Luke? We can't mention the word of God carelessly. This is in 19. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Therefore, God subdues the people, the evil peoples, whose leader sends them all to attack us under our feet. But why is that? So that we can trample them. That is our authority. We have that much power, brethren. It doesn't matter what is affecting you and what he's attacking. What matters is 
that now, thanks to this understanding, he's under your authority, and you shall trample him, you shall crush him, you should totally destroy him, for God is giving you this victory in the name of the Lord Jesus. It's God who does that, and God is supreme. God has the right. God created everything that ever existed. Therefore, when God wants to work, God shall work, and he doesn't have to render accounts to anyone. And God is saying, I subdue them, I put them, I put them under my authority, those evil powers that have been affecting your lives. And why? So that you can trample them and crush them and totally destroy them and make the enemy learn the lesson of his life like he has never learned before. That is, he is not supposed to touch you or even come near you because you're a child of God in the name of Jesus. Brethren, having faith in the Lord is not is a, a philosophical faith where we come in here and we keep singing and singing hallelujah and then we leave. Faith in Christ Jesus is struggling. It means going to the battlefield and knocking down the devil, trampling him and coming out victorious for the glory of the Lord God. That is how Jesus is glorified. And whatever you ask and determine in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified. And if the Father is glorified, this means an abundant life, a life that is free from all evil, a life where one can truly say, I really live in the name of the Lord Jesus. So let's all believe the Lord is working in our lives and there are great things coming our way. Now we're going to study Genesis 28 verses 10 through 17. At this time, the Lord God was guiding Jacob's life. Jacob and Esau were twin brothers. Esau was born first, but Esau couldn't be the patriarch of God's children. God so then chose Jacob. It doesn't matter whether someone is ahead of you. If God chose you, then the blessing shall be yours. And Esau made an arrangement with Jacob. He was very hungry. Please, brother, give me some lentil stew. Jacob asked, what will you give me in return? What do you want? So Jacob said, will you sell me your birthright for this stew of lentils? Yes, I will. This is worthless, and he sold it as of that day. So Jacob was given the right to plead and claim what was his because it was sold to him and he had bought it. And then Esau told his brother, I'm going to kill you. And Isaac called him and said, Son, arise and flee to my father's land, uh, where my father came from, and stay there for a few days until things calmed down. And when he was on his way out, he had a meeting with God. He was going to sleep. And he dreamt a ladder was set up on earth and there were angels of God ascending and descending on it. And what did God tell him? This is all in Genesis chapter 28. Let's start with verse 13. Genesis 28 verse 13. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham your father and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie I will give to you and your descendants. Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south, and in you and in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. And what did Jacob do? He held on to that promise. And the years passed, and now we're going to Genesis at 32, which I, I mentioned earlier, actually it's verse number 22. Jacob just wouldn't let that promise uh, slip away, like many times we do, by not taking possession of it. After over 20 years, Jacob felt the Lord telling him to return to his land. When he was approaching his land, a messenger came by and said, Be careful, your brother Esau is coming to meet you, and 400 men are with him. There was no other man in the family except for himself, and all of his children were very young, and he only had the two wives and two concubines. So what was Jacob supposed to do against that violent man who was coming to meet him together with 400 others? He had many things to do. What do you need to do against the evil that is attacking you and that is willing to destroy your life? That evil is not just playing around. If you let him, he will completely destroy you, and you shall leave here too early, and you shall never have all of your dreams come true, which are the dreams that God has prepared for you, and which are far better than your personal dreams. So Jacob crossed over the fork of Jabbok, his wives and his children, and he stayed on the other side, and he started to wrestle with the Lord God. And how does anyone wrestle with God? 
When you have God's word or God's promise, brethren, that is God in your life. God said, I shall not leave you. I shall protect you. You shall go and you shall return. And God was there by his side the entire time. And Jacob's faith was so great that he saw God there. He grabbed God. He wrestled with God all night long. He came down as a man, as an angel. And the angel wanted to leave but he said, I will not let you go unless, unless you bless me. And Jacob, at that moment, he realized that he saw God and wrestled with him. God was wrestling with Esau for Jacob. And when they finally met, it was all hugs and kisses, and there was absolutely no violence between them. Brethren, this word is for us to keep in our hearts. God had said, I shall come with you. The day that you receive any revelation from the word of God, then God shall be by your side as of that day to deliver on that promise as many times as needed because he has promised you. But you don't know about that. You don't hold on to that. You don't wrestle with God. You have to wrestle so that the enemies can be beaten because he's promised to put them all under your feet so that you can trample them with the power that God has given you. You must believe that. Saul didn't understand a thing. This is written in 1 Samuel. Saul was called to become the king of Israel. Until then, there were only judges in Israel. Samuel was a judge. God didn't want Israel to have any kings, but they kept asking and asking, and finally God said, all right, have kings. And who he chose was Saul. He was strong. He was very capable. He was a truly powerful king. But Saul didn't seem to realize that every word sent down by the Lord God was God by his side, both to bless him and to admonish him. If God tells you that something is a sin, and it is, as the Holy Scriptures say, and you keep sinning, then one of these days God shall admonish you. What you are doing is making fun of whoever's next to you. The first thing that happened, and that is written in 1 Samuel 13, God said, I will punish Amalek for what he did to the Israelites when they were heading toward the land of promise, for Amalek actually ambushed them. The people were not paying much attention, and he killed many people that day. He killed many men from Israel. And God said, For some day I shall blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And now God called uh, Saul to do just that. And Saul knew that. Shall we open our Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 13? We're going to read the word of the Lord God from verse 1 to 14. Saul knew exactly what he had to do because Samuel, who had anointed him, Samuel, who had been called by the Lord God as judge to anoint Saul, said to him in a very clear manner, it's 1 Samuel chapter number 13. Shall we read what's written? Saul reigned one year, and when he had reigned two years over Israel, Saul chose for himself 3,000 men of Israel. 2,000 were with Saul in Michmash, and the story goes on and on. Let's move to another passage. Let's jump to verse 4. Now all Israel heard it said that Saul had attacked a garrison of the Philistines and that Israel had also become an abomination to the Philistines. And the people were called together to Saul at Gilgal. Then the Philistines gathered together to fight with Israel. 30,000 chariots. That's a lot of chariots. They were all pulled by animals, right? Horses. And 6,000 horsemen and people as the sand which is on the seashore in multitude. And they came up and encamped in Michmash to the east of Beth Avon. When the men of Israel saw that they were in danger, for the people were distressed, then the people hid in caves, in thickets, in rocks, in holes, and in pits. And some of the Hebrews crossed over the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. As for Saul, he was still in Gilgal, and all the people followed him trembling. Then he waited seven days according to the time set by Samuel. So let's analyze this. So the Philistines came in great number because Saul had attacked them. As the sand which is on the seashore in multitude in comparison to his group, when Saul's group saw they ran away in all directions and those who stayed were trembling. And Samuel sent them a message, I'm coming over to give blessings. And when Samuel blessed them, then they became victorious. 
But what did Saul do? He waited seven days, and his heart was in distress. Going to verse 9, So Saul said, Bring a burnt offering and peace offerings here to me. And he offered the burnt offering. Now it happened, as soon as he had finished presenting the burnt offering, that Samuel came, and Saul went out to meet him that he might greet him. And Samuel said, What have you done? Saul said, When I saw that the people were scattered from me, and that you did not come within the days appointed, and that the Philistines gathered together at Michmash, then I said, The Philistines will now come down on me at Gilgal, and I have not made supplication to the Lord. Therefore I felt compelled and offered a burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, You have done foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded for you. For now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever, but now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be commander over his people, because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. This is very serious. God gave him a commandment, and God was right there by his side to protect him. But Samuel took too long. It doesn't matter if he took too long. It doesn't matter what's threatening you. God allowed all of those things to happen so that their people, that their people could be greatly victorious. Saul failed to understand that and decided to do something he wasn't supposed to do. But what was he supposed to do? Wait for the prophet. But the people ran away. That's what cowards do. But those who belong to the Lord God shall be victorious in the end. Don't run away from the enemy. Face your enemy. Don't hide away. Don't, uh, 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 don't hide away from the house of God. Unless God doesn't solve any problems, I'm not coming to the house of God. The devil is the one who told that to you. This is where you're going to solve your problems. This is where you're going to be victorious. It's with this kind of revelation that you're going to become blessed. Saul came forward and offered. It was completely useless. And Samuel said, God has chosen someone else instead now. You lost your kingdom, Saul. Why have you done that? My beloved brethren, we must follow the word of God at all times. It doesn't matter whether everyone leaves us all alone. We must remain firm, because what it really matters is the one who is by your side. The day God made a promise, he was saying, I'm by your side to bring you the victory. But things are too hard. I won't make it. But who said that to you? You're making the devil stronger this way. You need to confess whatever it is that God is telling you. In chapter 15, which I'm not going to read, God then commanded him to destroy Agag, who was the king. It's in chapter 15. It's quite clear. We won't have time to read everything, brethren. It's too much material, and praise the Lord for that. Verse 2. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel, how he ambushed him on the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and do not spare them, but kill... Well, now this refers to total destruction, which is symbolic. And their king, Agag, was a very charismatic man. And when Samuel got there, what did he find there? He saw Agag defeated next to, to, to Saul. And God commanded everything being destroyed, including the oxen and the sheep. However, Saul decided to spare the best of the oxen and the sheep. He didn't kill them. And Samuel said, What have you done? What then is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? Well, the people asked me, so I decided to spare them. What about Agag? Well, I decided to spare Agag as well. And what Samuel told him was serious. It's in verse 22, which we shall read. Samuel opened his heart, and here's what he said. Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. And when Samuel was leaving, he seized the edge of his robe and it tore. And Samuel said, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel. Nothing would have happened at all. If only Saul had understood that God had told him he would be by his side to help him. 
When God said, consecrate yourselves, and you're not doing that, God is by your side so that you can consecrate yourself. And then you start a love affair, cheating on your wife, an adulterous affair on your husband, and then you're committing that sin right before the eyes of the Lord. God, I can't take it anymore. God will certainly give you a way of escape. God will give you victory. And when you're dishonest, when you're a liar, or when you do anything wrong at all, you're just, you're just simply abusing the Lord's trust, walking all over the Son of God. And you can't do that. The Word of God is Jesus by your side to give you victory. He shouldn't have done what he did in chapter 13 or what he did in chapter 15. He lost. God chose David. Brethren, don't lose it all. The victory shall be yours. The devil can no longer defeat you. God is by your side. Jacob held on to God. He wrestled with the angel all night long. No man can wrestle all night long, but can you imagine with God? But the angel said, you have wrestled with God and you have won, and the victory is yours, and the victory shall be yours. Hold on to that, remain firm, because today is the day of good news. Amen, brethren? And now let's watch the real life drama for today. I met Marta in a party here in the town, you know. Two or three years later, we moved in together. However, it wasn't something really serious, you know. I was with her, but I didn't respect her, you know? All of a sudden, he had moved into my house. Sometimes I would tell her I was going to the pub, but I wasn't really going there, you know? So I would actually go to other places instead. And I got home very late at night, you know? Women, parties, friends. I didn't live the life of a married man. He would drink heavily, you know? His mood would immediately change. I told him off, you know? I would say I didn't want that kind of thing for my life, you know, it was really terrible. When she started to talk about it, you know, when she started to discuss that, I would just get up and leave. And in the meanwhile, I I started going, going to the, to the church. My mother talked to me about the faith show when she first heard about it. My husband would go out with his friends and stay out and I stayed at home. The next day, you see, I was going to the church already. So if it was Sunday, I just left. She got firm at the faith show. She got firm at the church, started going to church, and she started interceding for me. My life didn't have any kind of value at all, you know. I thought about having something in life, but at the same time, I didn't have the strength to try. Then I asked the Lord God to start changing me, you know. Then God started to change me, and I would seek Him. I interceded for my husband, and sometimes he would be mad at me. Sometimes I would come home early in the morning, you know. She was leaving for work, and I was coming home. Then she would leave worship songs on the radio, you know. And I would hear the songs while I lied in bed. I heard them. And then the Lord, God, has started working in my life, you know. He started helping me to get back up because I didn't have the strength to do it. Thanks to the faith, I could already see him going to the house of God, to church. After Martha started seeking the Lord, then I started going to church too. Our pastor was Pastor Joyce. But then I would, I would get tougher in my heart because she would start to preach and teach and I wouldn't accept it, you know? You know, a woman teaching me how to, how to deal with my house, you know? I was such a sexist and God worked in my life and my heart and it took about six months. And finally, I didn't want to live like that anymore. So I came home from work. My desire was to be in church and listen to the word. At home, I would spend my time reading the Bible. God is so perfect. When you least expect, people are completely transformed already. He started to change. He started to pay more attention, you know. He realized it. He was wrong, right? His habits were wrong. He noticed his friends who, who would come over suddenly stopped coming over. And we started to live our lives with God together. And God opened this door in the segment of electricity. And Dr. Suarez would preach and say that people could start sponsoring the company that didn't exist yet, you know? So if someone wants to start their own company, you know, they should sponsor. That's when I felt in my heart, you know, that I should become a sponsor. Sometime later, Mikan started his own business. It's a company in the field of electrical installation, you know, at houses, companies, schools. It's called Cardoso Instalações. I have a lot of clients and I'm getting even more. 
and God has been blessing me and my family with our finances. And today, thank God, we have bought a plot of land, our house is fully paid. The couple is now officially married. God honored and blessed us greatly. I love my wife and I respect her. Today, thanks to the Lord God, we have peace in our house and in our family. Oh, glory to God. Bend down your head and close your eyes. God, give wisdom to our people. Lord, it's so sad. My Lord, no one deserves to be suffering. Jesus paid the price for that already. Jesus said he came to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Oh God, please set at liberty those who are oppressed, including those who are joining me in prayer now and who are being held captive by addiction to smoking. The doctors said it's bad for you. And some people don't seem to believe that. But then they end up having emphysema or cancer or retinal detachment or erectile dysfunction or frigidity. And only then will people say I was so stupid. Why won't they seek the Lord God? Why won't they consecrate themselves? Lord, I join my faith to the faith of these people. Brethren, I join you in this battle. And as minister of the Lord God, I'm going to use the authority you have given me. And I command all evil to leave now. I demand it. I'll determine it. God, you warrant it. And this is in your word that the people's and the groups of demons are under your power. Therefore, this demon that today is acting as master of those lives, who's been telling them what to do and imposing their ordeals, well, they shall pick up everything. God, they shall leave now. Brethren, they shall leave. As the minister of the word of God, this is the moment. Please keep your eyes closed. I'm commanding right now, you demon, leave. Pick up everything that is yours. Pick up your lies, for you're convincing these people to agree with you and accept your ordeals, inventing reasons and reasons, for I'm commanding you to leave right now with all of your reasons. Leave right now in the name of Jesus Christ. 